Thank you for coming, y'all, after a holiday weekend. I feel like I'm amongst family. There's lots of very familiar faces in here. Um, thanks for coming. Um, it's This is not going to be plant heavy. I've got... 10, 11, 12, 15-ish, I guess that's kind of heavy, um, plants. I want to talk mostly about the, the process of, of what we did to get kind of a new garden area, because that's kind of a new thing here, and why we took the old out and put the new in, and, and we'll, we'll do that down there. Um, Vivian had a really good moniker for what I, I am today, and I'm going to get it wrong. I know I am. She called me the, the, the Burmese ambassador. The Burmese ambassador. Um, it took me about about a good 15, 20 seconds for me to figure that out because I haven't had my coffee this morning, but that's that's a good one. That's what I need to, I need to write that down. What's that? Berminator. Berminator, that's even, that's, that's a good one too. <laughs> Let's think of these as we, as we go along and we'll, we'll add these to the video, but um, we're gonna walk that way and set up there so that we can spend our time down there talking about stuff. So let's go for a journey. It wasn't too bad of a journey. So um, when I first started, um, Mark and I had talked about redoing a garden area, and um, this this was it. This was kind of a, a site where wasn't a lot going on. Um, older plants, things that JC had planted along the fence line for evaluations, um, some fastigiate plants. There was a um, Southern Magnolia, a Hassie, which is an upright one. It's one of my favorites. They were kind of along the fence and really had to make the hard decision that here was a big chunk of property um, in, in the, you know, the dwindling space here at the Arboretum where we could maybe do something different and add some diversity. Um, we had a lot of plants in the nursery at that time frame, things that were getting really, really big that needed to be planted out, and we didn't have any place to put them. So with ideas from other gardens, um, we don't have any space to, to spread out, but we have lots of space to go up. So the idea to put the berms in was was kind of born, and that, um, that led to a great big pile of soil that was on the gathering on for um, one or two weeks, I think, if I remember correctly. And once we figured out what we wanted to do, move that soil down here and kind of built what you see. And we'll talk about that in, from some different vantage points. So we took this kind of static part of the Arboretum and we incorporated these berms so that we could go up. The other idea behind that was having some really good loose soil for some of the plants that we had. They needed that to develop good root systems and to kind of thrive here. So um, regenerating a new area, planting some, some plants that were in our nursery that desperately needed to go, but also it's very loud right here. You've got all the interstate stuff going on, all that construction. You got the nice view of our, our, our very good friends and neighbors, Capital City Lumber, and we are slowly replacing the fence line. So it kind of made sense to, to kind of rejuvenate this. For a lot of people, this is their first impression of the Arboretum. This is what they see when they come down Barrel Road. And right now, it's not quite sure if it's a, a prison or, or what, because you've got this bob wire fence and, and not a lot to see. So we thought about all those things when we started to kind of do this design. So the palette of plants were things that we desperately needed to plant, but <clears throat> things that were favorites of ours, lots of magnolias, lots of witch hazels, um, other things, uh, and wanting it to look good, winter, spring, summer, fall. So incorporating all those different layers of things. There's conifers in here, there's flowering plants in here, and ultimately, there are some areas where we're gonna to incorporate some herbaceous plants. So we've got a lot of wet areas. Water management is a big part of this area because everything comes down to this corner down here and we have to figure out a creative way to, uh, creative and sustainable way to, to manage that. So there's some other phases of this that will be developed where we'll, we'll collect that water and uh, use it so that it stays on site. It doesn't go into the drain system. All those things were going on through the whole entire process of 
this. The other side of it that we wanted to do was to incorporate this into the greater rest of the rest of the garden. We didn't want it to be kind of a thing all by itself. We wanted it to, to blend together. That was really important to us too. So there's gonna be some editing along the edge to kind of make that work. There's some paths that go from the berms and kind of weave in again to kind of tie that together to make this a good experience for uh, for visitors and, and members. So that was kind of the, the method to the to the madness. And we'll talk about those things in a little more detail as we go on. Um, it's still much, uh, very much a work in progress. We're finishing up the pads. We're mulching. There's a lot of editing I want to do along the edge. We've got more stuff that we want to plant and we're going to be doing that uh, Thursday. Um, we've got some stuff lined up to go here and some other places. So this is going to continue for a while. Um, once we get everything mulched, all the paths mulched, I'll feel a little bit better about it being close to, to done. But, you know, there's weeds in here already. Um, some of the paths have washed away with the rain that we have. It's, it's a garden. It's going to require some of those some of those works. So that's kind of the, the abbreviated version of, of, of what's going on here. Um, for those of you that, that watch this and haven't been here yet, um, there's some very interesting things in here to see. And things have really, um, uh, knock on wood, we didn't have a whole lot of losses. Right after we planted this is when the weather turned. It got hot and Mother Nature turned the water off. So um, my, my, my crew and myself have spent a lot of quality hours dragging hoses in amongst all these things to make sure that it stays alive um, uh, right up to last week. So I, I hope we're kind of out of the woods with that, but it's a garden. There's gonna be a lot of stuff you have to do to maintain it. Any questions about that before I start talking about plants? Um, the question was, what is the, the soil composition? When we first got the soil, it was from a project on the, at the, the Centennial campus. And a lot of times when somebody says, we have soil for you, it's not soil. It's, it's subsoil, it's, it's the junk they wanna get rid of. This was actually pretty decent soil. So we really lucked out. Um, so we started with that. We incorporated a, a pretty good amount of compost in with it from compost we had on site. We also used a product called Sunrock, which is very similar to Staylight, only it's a little bit finer, and it gave some pore space and helped with drainage. Um, and we also put some Staylight in here too, and, and just mixed it all together. It was very unscientific, but most of what we planted in, once it was moved from there to here and then around several times, um, the places where the soil is the worst is kind of in the edges of the beds and right along the fence line where we didn't change things. But the soil with the berms itself is really, really good. And if you look at the stuff that's on the berms, that's the stuff that I think is doing the best be because of that. So. Um, after we put the soil in here, the very next thing we did was mulch the berms to keep that soil from kind of washing away. And this is the same mulch we use in the rest of the garden. It's the, the leaf compost. All right, the very first plant I want to talk about, and I mentioned magnolias. I have a very big spot in my heart for magnolias. And to me, this was an opportunity. Um, blank space, let's take a lot of the magnolias that we have back in the nursery and let's plant them here in the berms. So right behind me, um, I really like the evergreen magnolias. This is a southern magnolia, Magnolia grandiflora um, pygmaea. It's a true dwarf. You can tell by the, the size of the leaf, it's gonna be really, really small. Um, not a lot of new growth between those inner nodes. Like that's this year's new growth, and it's got a big flat flower on top of it already. So very happy in this new environment, very happy to get out of the big pot that it was in, but we've peppered magnolias all through here, both deciduous and evergreen ones. But um, I'm really interested to see what this guy is gonna kind of do and, and, and develop. Um, I'm not familiar with it, it's, it's a new one to me. We didn't have it in uh, collections where I used to work, but very excited to start off the experience into the berms with a uh, Southern Magnolia, yes. Uh, the question was, was dwarf, how high will it get? Um, that's a very good question because a lot of times either plants don't read the rules or, you know, you take something like a dwarf cryptomeria, a cryptomeria can be 100 feet tall, and if it's 50 feet tall, that's that's kind of a dwarf. Um, this one, the, the, the books say 10 to 15 feet. Um, we'll, we'll see if that holds true. Um, again, I've not, I'm not super familiar with this one, but it, it needed a new home, so, so, so here it is. And this gives us a chance to kind of watch it and 
and see what it's gonna do. I think in ideal conditions, it might get bigger than that, but that's really, really tight new growth, so I don't think it's gonna get super big. Finger, fingers crossed. All right, let's move on down. The question was, what's the good looking redbud behind me? This is an unnamed one um, through the uh, Denny Werner's program. Um, and it's it's one that um, they may start to develop. It's got a whole series of numbers right now. And again, it was down in the nursery. And that's another thing that we were thinking about when we were selecting plants for here is to kind of pay homage to the history of what NC State has done, to what JC has done. And we've got a very strong history of developing redbuds. So there's a lot Lot of red buds planted through here as well. And again, I wanted something that looked good winter, spring, summer, fall. So nice leaf color, um, nice flowers in the spring, and you know, it's gonna develop kind of a nice round habit, it looks like. Anybody else? All right, the next one is right here. Witch hazels are another favorite of mine, and we were lucky to uh, be gifted a bunch from a nursery friend of ours up in Ohio. Um, this is Hamamelis vernalis squib. Um, Vernalis is the Ozoke, Ozark witch hazel, so it is a, a native one. And uh, this one has, was developed because it's, it's kind of um, more squat in nature. The Hamamelis vernalis can get kind of big and spreading. This one's a little more compact and has really nice kind of sulfur yellow flowers on it in um, uh, early to, to mid winter and also some, some nice fragrance. So again, thinking about things that are gonna look good winter, spring, summer, fall, but close to the path here so that people can catch the, the fragrance. That was, that was the idea behind this. So again, very, very happy on this kind of a nice well-drained environment and taking advantage of this situation. Um, I, I'm over the moon with how well things have performed here. I thought we'd have a, a lot more losses with the summer that we've had, but things have done really, really well. Things that, that we lost, I'm not super surprised because some of the root balls are really, really um, bound and, and, and confined in the pots that we had. But Hamamelis for now is squib, um, one that we're gonna keep our eye on and see how it, how it goes. Any questions? All right, let's move on down. Again, in the spirit of, of things that we do here at the Ralston, um, this is a uh, Circus Chuniana. This is a recently introduced um, redbud species from our colleagues at Atlanta Botanic Garden, um, found in China. There's a great big one planted at the at the entrance, and this pays homage to our interest in red buds, but also the the plant exploring that we've done quite a bit here. So this is one that has really really pretty long racemes of flowers. Um, this thing has probably almost doubled in size since we planted it this summer. It likes the heat, and we found a good spot for it here. Um, right next to it is a magnolia, and I think we were a bit ambitious in our planting spacing maybe. So um, one of these two is gonna get moved this fall, probably this guy. Um, we had somebody check out down here below, so I might move it down a little bit. But we, um, when we're putting plants out, we try to be conscious of having enough space, but at the same time, we wanna do things like block the view and make it look as much like a garden after we're done as possible. And a lot of times this happens uh, all too often. Um, I'm one of the worst at putting things too close together. Um, I take full responsibility for this, but um, I think this fall, because the soil is loose, it shouldn't be too hard to, to dig this out and, and, and move it. I want to leave this here because we want to see what it's gonna what it's gonna do, um, and lots of opportunity for us to, to propagate it as well. But really, really happy here. All this stuff is is new growth. Very, very fast growing. Any questions about this guy? And if you want to pan behind, I was going to talk about some of the drainage stuff that we're doing and I'll, I'll hop over. So some of the, the difficulties with putting in new beds is, is dealing with the water drainage. Um, we worked with uh, Justin Durango, a good friend to the Arboretum and former intern. Um, he worked absolute magic in the way that he laid out the, the soil here and the paths so that things drained in areas that we wanted it to. Right behind me is kind of a, a wet area and we're gonna kind of manage it as that. So eventually we'll plant a pallet 
pallet of plants in here that can take that wet situation. It's not gonna stay wet all the time. Um, we probably had, if I had to guess, maybe two to three inches of rain this weekend. So there's still some water setting, but it moves through pretty, pretty well. And as it's moving through, it's draining back into the soil. Um, we want that to continue, but we also want plants in here to add to the diversity, but also to take up some of that water and slow down that, that movement. So we've done some of that um, here and there. There's some carex planted in some areas, but this spring we hope to add a whole lot more to help with that, that uh, managing of, of, the, of the water here. So everything is kind of drained, uh, leveled on purpose. It's kind of hard to see, but if you look at the path here, it slowly slopes this way so that the water comes and catches in these areas instead of going towards the road or washing away the, the planting beds and the plants in it. So a lot of thought went into that and just the skill of somebody that can, can, that can see that and know the, the right ways to do that. So you'll see some of these areas on this side of the garden as we kind of go down through. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out here is we really want to marry this new garden to this area so that there's a reason to kind of go to, to both. So that if you're coming from that direction, there's gonna be paths that come that lead you here. And if you get here and you decide you wanna go someplace else, you have the opportunity to go explore other parts of the Arboretum. And there's a lot of really good hidden treasures in this part between us and the White Garden and the, the main lawn. So we're gonna, we've already started to do some pruning. We're gonna do some removals and editing, and that's gonna give us opportunity for new plants, but just to kind of open things up and kind of tie things together. So all that stuff is kind of going on behind the, behind the scenes. Yes. The question was um, with, with the wet area behind us and other places, um, is there any discussion of water features? And one of the original plans for this area started with that was down in the corner where all the water collects, and we'll head down there in a little bit, was to put something to catch the water and have kind of a water feature there and use that water either for irrigation or just to kind of slowly seep back into the, into the ground or slowly make its way back into the water catchment system for the, for the city. Um, we really want to be good stewards and collect and keep that water here, keep it from going into the, the drain systems. So I think eventually in, in the future, we'll do something like that there. So that at the very end, we've kind of left an area unfinished to where we could, we could put that in if we want to do that. And um, that'll also tie into some other things that we're thinking about up in the garden to catch water and, and slow the water down too. So all that stuff will, will be tied together eventually. That was a good question. Anybody else? The next one is right behind us. Wayne just asked a really good question. It's worth mentioning. He asked if there's irrigation in here and, and we did not do that. There are a series of quick connects all the way down through where we've got places to hook hoses and sprinklers if we need to. Um, we all were, were cussing and second guessing that through the summer as we're dragging hoses. It was very dusty and, and there's no way to get out of the sun in here, um, but at least having those areas to, to connect hoses and things and sprinklers was, was very helpful. And most of the garden is like that. Um, we, we tend to err on, on tough love here, get things established and uh, monitor with a, a degree of things are, are gonna have to take care of themselves, unfortunately. But to get things established, we, we were stayed on top of it all, all summer long. Um, next plant I wanted to mention is right behind me. This is Lagostromia excelsa. This is a um, kind of an unusual species of crepe myrtle. Um, there are, most people don't know, there's probably at least 50 different species of crepe myrtle. This is a, a, an Asian variety. This is gonna get big, um, 20 to 30 feet, probably as wide, nice white flowers, likes the heat. This is another plant that just exploded once we got it out of the pot and into the ground that we've been pleasantly su surprised by. Lots of um, new growth coming up and very, very happy here. The conifer here is a dwarf that's going to kind of mound over. I think they're going to be nice neighbors. It's going to hopefully go up. And again, winter, spring, summer, fall interest. Any questions about this one? All right, let's move on. 
a, a bit of a Magnolia love fest, really gave us an opportunity to get some things that have been in the, in the nursery for a long time. And um, we had quite a few Magnolias in, in, the, in, in the back in the nursery. This is Magnolia sapiensis. This is one from Vietnam and has a really beautiful flower, kind of semi-fragrant and quite a few buds on here already. A lot of times these get blasted because it flowers so late, but we've had such a hot summer, they've kind of persisted. Um, usually you don't get to see these, these nice flowers. We planted this one here a little bit closer to the edge. Um, it's marginally hardy. It's a strong zone eight magnolia. And um, we're, we're again, tough love. We're hoping that it makes it out here, but being against the edge here, it's a little bit protected from the, the, the swings of the weather, but lots of flower buds on it, lots of new growth. Again, it was happy to get out of the pot and something that we're gonna keep a close eye on and see how it does. Um, evergreen, nice thick foliage, and just a, a gorgeous semi-fragrant flower um, and just covered with, with flower buds. Another big one right here. But just kind of these curiosities to see how, they, how, they, how they're gonna perform. All right, we're gonna go right across the way here. So I, I come in this way every morning, so I, I, I take a little passive aggressive peek as to what's going on here, mostly checking for weeds, um, for wilty plants. Um, but this Acer palmatum, um, this is Acer palmatum Golden Falls, has been kind of a bright spot on those hot summer rides in. It's absolutely been glowing, and all this new growth was bright red when it first came out, and you can see that coming up the road. Um, it always kind of, uh, was that bright beacon coming in in the morning. And part of the reason we planted this is our history was with um, Japanese maples. Uh, there are so many good ones. And this one is kind of a weeper. So we're hoping that it gets big and starts to do what it's already doing and kind of creeping its way down the side of the berm to kind of soften it a little bit. But a lot of, um, Japanese maples planted throughout the berms as well, and also kind of tying that into what's what's behind us. This is from our friends, uh, Mr. Maple. Really, really nice one. Uh, the question was, very good question, is it gonna lot like the hot summer? And we did some of that stuff on purpose. We wanna see what these plants are gonna do, and we didn't have a landscape design for this. We had a ton of plants in the nursery, um, and Tim and I, we brought them here right behind us in the shady spot. We dumped them all a couple days before, and Timmy came out, came out the, that next morning, and he's like, how are you gonna do this? And I was like, go with your heart, in the words of, <laughs> uh, go with your heart, let's see what happens. And we had some things that we wanted to, to do and places we wanted things, like the magnolias and things like that, but stuff like this, we're gonna, we're gonna kinda see what, uh, how, how it performs. So far, so good. I mean, it was brutal this summer, and there's no respite from the, from the heat out here, and it has really performed above what we what we thought it would. We're not doing this to hurt the plants. Um, we're, we're doing it to get them out of the nursery. I'd rather kill them out here than, than kill them back there. <laughs> um, but so far, so good with, with most of these things. Any other questions? That was a good one. All right, right here. D despite my, um, my laissez-faire attitude of, of ripping things out and putting new things in, um, it actually is hard to, to, to do that but um, we, we look at it in, in terms of progress. But along the edge here, um, we're looking at things with a little bit closer eye. And um, this next one behind us, this is Carpinus betulus pendula, um, weeping hornbeam. And this tree was so beautiful here. We were really careful when we were moving the soil around when we were grading not to disturb it. And once um, I mentioned Justin Durango helping us with this, he called me out here. He's like, I want to do something with this. It's such a nice anchor point and such a beautiful tree. I want to prune it and put a path through it so that you actually get to engage with the, with the plant from the other side. And what a, what a great idea. So we've done that. You see the, the flags here and the flags continue through the, this part of the berms. Um, this is gonna be a path. We're gonna wood chip it um, to kind of signify that that's where all the paths are, and this will tie into the garden behind us. Again, tying those two things together. So 
the nice architectural tree here that we did our best to protect from uh, the water moving and the soil and, and the machinery. And uh, again, knock on wood, so far so good. So pulling in some of that old stuff with the new stuff was very much on our, our minds when we, when we did this a, as well. And I just love this tree and I'm glad that we, that we left it because there was talk when we first came in here to, to, to do more editing on this side. And um, it, you know, we moved the soil to accommodate this tree. Um, that was very much a thought going all through here. Any questions? I was gonna go up. When in doubt, go up. I mentioned uh, tying conifers into this as well, again, to add that interest. And to, in the winter time, we didn't want this to, we knew this was gonna be stark for several years, more soil and mulch than green plant material. So we were very conscious of adding to that, that palette and, and putting some evergreen stuff in. Um, this is a Japanese black pine, Pinus thumbergii, and this one called War Bonnet. This plant's claim to fame is in the wintertime, all this new growth will have a kind of a nice yellow tinge to it. And just with the cold temperatures that were cold, just with the cooler temperatures that we've had lately, it's already started to turn a little bit yellow. It wasn't like this a couple weeks ago. So Again, winter, spring, summer, fall. Um, we, we use that to our full advantage all through the Arboretum and, and the berms was, was no exception. We want there to be something interesting to look at all year long and, and, and have that interest. <clears throat> Again, this was a great big guy in the nursery and those were the first things that we put on the carts to bring out here was the big stuff so that we could give it a, a fighting chance in the ground um, instead of, um, kind of kind of doomed back in the back. But um, very eager to see how this one's gonna perform and, and so far so good. Any questions? Yeah. Yes. Very good question. A lot of this stuff was root bound. What did we do to, uh, to get those plants in a, in a state that they would, would branch out from the, the root balls? What's that? How mean, were How mean were we to get these plants um, uh, on root bound? Um, that's, that's probably the, the only time in my life when I'm mean is when I'm ripping up a root ball and it's, it's for its own good. It's for its own good. Um, there's tons of research out there that says you have to disturb that root ball. Uh, I was involved with a lot of that prior to coming here. So something like this was in a 15 gallon pot, completely girdled roots. And we had the soil excavators, you know, the three pronged hook guys, and just rip those up. All, all, everybody that helped with this, I did a demo beforehand. So everything out here, we did that too. Um, if you don't do that, it's just gonna continue to, to do that circling thing. So between that, the time of the year that we planted, I thought we would lose a lot more stuff because the odds are you're gonna cause a lot of stress, but if you don't do that, it's gonna girdle itself and it's gonna die anyway. This one was really, really girdled and so far, so far so good, it's, it's, it's held up. But a lot of this, not everything in here, um, but a lot of the bigger things were, uh, were had been in the pot way too long. And we, we took that, uh, we used those measures to ensure that they would have a fighting chance. Any other questions? We're going that way. So right below me is, is kind of where all the water from the top eventually moves. And when we planted this area down here, most of what we put in here is stuff that can take kind of that, that wet and then that dry and then that wet again. <clears throat> this area is kind of designed so that if we get a big storm, the water can collect here. And if it's really big, it'll cross that path and go over and collect down there and eventually work its way in the soil. And we'll look a little closer in a minute, but down in that corner is where that water feature might eventually go, um, is in that part of the, of the garden there. So the water moves through here. There's a big pipe right in front of us that collects it from this other side and eventually distributes it and lets it kind of seep back into the soil instead of going into the, the city drain systems. Again, testament to, to Justin's creativity. We had this little area where we dug out so that the water could move. These three stones came were the steps in front of the, um, the necessary. We redid the path to the necessary to make it ADA accessible, and we had these these uh, pavers to use. So we 
picked them up and uh, decided to use them here as kind of a, a wet weather bridge. And um, I like reusing things like that. Otherwise, they would they'd probably be in the back for 20, 30 years before somebody decided to do something with them. So we picked them up and brought them here instead of taking them in the back. So I, I like reusing things like that. <clears throat> Another good vantage point to see how we're tying that existing part into the new with pads. We've already started to do some editing. <clears throat> we really wanted to feature this, this pretty uh, plane tree because it's got such nice bark and it's one of the biggest things in here. <clears throat> with that thought in mind, all the stuff planted on, on this berm, we wanted to be a little bit smaller so that it doesn't compete with that and block the view of that eventually. So I hope we haven't doomed that to an early death by featuring it, but sometimes that's what happens. But that was very much um, part of the way that we did this, this middle area, was thinking about what eventually was gonna happen there. Lots of wet weather stuff. We put some crinums in here. There's carex, there's hibiscus, lots of irises. Again, things to kind of help manage that water to slow it down and absorb as much of that as possible and add that whole herbaceous layer. To, to this part of the part of the garden as well. Any questions about that? All right, the next tree is right behind us. Not the prettiest plant in here, but a, a good example of what I was talking about earlier, <clears throat> things that were really big in the pot. This was in a 15-gallon pot, another root-bound thing that we thought, all right, it's, it's going to die in the back because there's no point in repotting it. So let's put it in the ground here and see what happens. When we pulled it out of the, out of the pot, just completely root-bound, and I thought for sure this will be the first thing that went, but it, it didn't. It, it's still going. This is Hobart. This is um, a raisin tree, kind of an unusual plant. Gets really nice bark as it gets older. Gets a really small kind of pendulous fruit on it that looks like a raisin. Um, I, I've been told they were edible, but they don't taste like much. And uh, it only took me one try to say, don't, don't do that again. But again, uh, this speaks to the diversity of things that we have in the, in the, the arboretum. Um, I've never heard of this particular species. I think there's only one or two but plant it and kind of see what it does and evaluate it over time and and hopefully it'll be something that we can we can promote and maybe maybe propagate in the not too distant future but much happier here than than in a pot any questions Can you say the name of it again hovinia 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 with with an h the question was how many plants total did we put into the berms? And I counted um, a couple weeks afterwards and I wanna say it was close to 600. And that's some of the, the herbaceous things. We planted a lot of irises and things like that. Um, I, may be, I may be off, it might be a, um, a sun-induced memory, but for some reason that's sticking in, my, sticking in my, it was over 500. Any other questions? The tree growing in the water, um, that's Planera aquatica. That is, um, I'm glad you brought that up because this is a, a sentimental thing and another thing to pay homage to the Arboretum. This was a plant that my my dear friend Todd Lassane brought back. Um, he and Jenks Farmer found it on a plant exploring trip, I think in South Carolina. It's a, a plant that can grow in standing water. So it was scheduled to come out. It was crammed in here with a bunch of other things. It had um, planted along the fence are different species of Smilax. Smilax uh, is green bright with the great big thorns, completely covered with Smilax. But because Todd planted it, it had to stay. When Mark and I were flagging here, I was like, we can't cut this down. Uh, this is this is in homage to, to Todd. So I think just that that, that positive energy, cleaning all the, the, the vine off of it, we, we pruned the dead wood out of it. It was touching the sidewalk almost. We lifted it up. It's getting some love and attention now. I think it was featured in the newsletter, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm very happy that the tree is happier. Um, it, it seems to have responded to that, that energy and that attention and it's something that can take that water. So it, Planera is a plant that I think is often underused and, and it's a native, it should be used more. So we're hoping to propagate this and start putting it into our plant sales and our auctions and things like that. But, you know, it's one of those behind the scenes, uh, a picture's worth a thousand words. It's got all those memories attached to it, so it had to stay. Thank you for asking about that. I meant to write it down and I forgot. We don't have to go far for the next one. 
This is Pinus tadia, um, Little Albert. This is a dwarf loblolly pine. <clears throat> Again, uh, paying homage to some of the things that we do here. We've got the, uh, the, the dwarfs that are on the are surrounding kind of the main lawn. And this is one, I don't know if this was selected from those or not, but this is a, a true dwarf. This one will stay kind of small. First place I saw this was at um, uh, the John Ferry Gardens down outside of Houston, Texas. And that plant was maybe 10 feet tall, but stays nice and squat. So again, adding some evergreen, a little bit smaller in stature, so it doesn't compete with our tree behind us <clears throat> and adding that, that evergreen interest and eager to see how, how this develops as well. Any questions? Yes. And the question was, are there plans to replace the fence? Um, last year, we replaced the, the old fence here with the NC State brick columns and uh, the wrought iron, and it went down to a gate not far from here. <clears throat> there are plans to continue that from there all the way down to the corner. I think once we do that, this will be a much more welcoming, welcome to the J.C. Ralston Arboretum and look better. Um, it, it, you can't get much more uglier than than this fence behind me. It's it's you pretty. It look like a prison. Yes, it does. it's a plant prison. Um, it's 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 pretty ugly. When um, it's a super expensive thing, if um, anybody would like to write a big fat check for for those columns and fencing, we would gladly um, take you down to Neomons and talk about it. <laughs> but that that's that's what's holding it up. It, it's expensive. Uh, the brick columns. Uh, right after we put the uh, the new one in, I measured all the way down and um, somewhere out there is how many we need and how, how many uh, feet of fencing we're gonna need. But th th I'll be very happy when we get to that point. It'll look so much better. Yes, um, somebody just asked about the pine behind us. This is a, a dwarf loblolly behind us too. I forget how many we have in the Arboretum. There's there's several of them. Not not the same as this one. Not the same. <laughs> I see you sizing it up. Yeah, that, that's not Little Albert. That's that's one of the, uh, uh, yes, some of the, the dwarfs that are out, out in the front. So what's the history of Little Albert? I don't know. I don't know much about it. Um, the first place I saw it was in a garden in Texas many years ago. I don't know if it came from the ones that JC had. Um, I, I'm not 100% sure. I didn't have time to do my homework, I'm sorry. The next one is right behind us. I'm gonna hop over there. Again, some of the decisions we made when kind of editing, <clears throat> this is Cornus Cusa, variety chinensis, subspecies chinensis, Sam Zam, and it's a, a variegated uh, Cusa dogwood with um, kind of an evergreen nature bred into it. This tree has been super bright and kind of cheerful the entire time all this work went on and we, we wanted to leave it to add that, again, to add that interest. Dogwoods are, are a, a topic of much discussion now in the native plant world. The Cornus Cusas are much more disease tolerant than our native ones. And all those reasons were, were kind of why we kept it. Also has really nice fall color in between that variegated. You can see the, the red tones coming in with the change in temperature already. So this will definitely earn its keep here against kind of this dark backdrop, which is kind of why we, we decided to, to leave that. And one last one before we go. Um, continuing my Magnolia Love Fest, this is a, a plant that I first fell in love with my very first visit here. Um, over 20 years ago. This is Magnolia virginiana, and this is a true dwarf. This is uh, one of the Dodd small leaf. These were um, found in Alabama by a nurseryman whose last name was Dodd. Um, and there's several of them. Uh, some of them are named after rivers in Alabama, but they all are pretty much look, look the same. Very, very small leaf compared to our, 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 our straight species um, of the Sweet Bay Magnolia. You can see that silver underside of the leaf there, which adds a lot of interest. And these things will get little tiny um, flowers on them that have that super strong lemony smell that Sweet Bay gets. Um, I have one of these in a nursery at my last job one time, and I was picking plants out the plant, and I kept smelling something, I couldn't figure out what it was, and it was one of these completely covered with the flowers. Very, very small. So again, dwarf, evergreen, it's gonna add that winter interest. It's not gonna compete with our, our big star in the back, and 
wanted to get more of these out in the garden. There's a bigger one over close to the necessary where the magnolias are planted back in that path along the fence. Probably 10 to 15 feet tall. It's as big as they will ever get, but really slow growing. But wanted to end on a, on a favorite, and this is definitely one of my favorites. Any questions? Uh, the question was, where would you find one of those? <laughs> Pat McCracken used to grow this um, on occasion. Um, a lot of mail order nurseries. Uh, I think I, I bought one at Gosler Nursery years ago. They're out in um, Eugene, Oregon. Um, I would I would check with places places like that. It's they're they're hard to find. Um, the question was, would it take shade? Sweet Bay Magnolia can take a little bit of shade. You're not gonna get as many flowers and it's gonna be more leggy. The big one that we have up in the collection is in pretty dense shade at this point. And I, I checked it multiple times this summer and I never saw any flowers on it. It's not a heavy flower, but it has the cutest little tiny flowers on it. Sweet Bay Magnolia um, should be grown more. It's a really good, adaptable tree. Sun, a little bit of shade, it can take wet, it can take dry. Um, it's evergreen, but it's a really, really good magnolia. It looks a little bit like a calmia. I, I think I, when I had that one in my nursery and I couldn't figure out what it was, I thought it was a rhododendron because it's got that small kind of leaf to it. And I wasn't expecting to, to find a magnolia. All right, thanks y'all.